Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, my hometown, out on the edge of the prairie. Valentine's Day coming up on Tuesday, so love is in the air. All these teenage boys in the high school wondering what to give somebody for Valentine's Day, a card or a poem or chocolate or a necklace, and does she even want anything? And, or would she just be disgusted if you gave it to her? Or would there be a lot of eye rolling there? There's a lot of eye rolling on the part of teenage girls. It's a perilous, perilous situation for for teenage boys. The Moonlight Bay Supper Club is almost all completely reserved for Valentine's Day evening, the four course dinner, your choice of soup or salad. You've got the shrimp appetizer, you have the steak and seafood platter, and, and you have the, 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 the lime jello fluff. <laughs> your choice of tater tot hot dish as well, if you would, if you would, prefer that. It turned cold on Friday. It had been up in the up in the 50s and then it's 40s and, th and then suddenly it, it descended about 30 degrees just right there on Friday and it was a great beautiful slap in the face to people. It's back to reality. I'm one of those people who believe that cold is a stimulant and warmth is a sedative and and it works that way. All these people who are thinking about mortality and thinking about aging and people in their 30s who were looking in the mirror and examining their skin closely and, and studying their eyebrows, which just didn't seem to lift in the same way anymore. And they were trying out different expressions in the mirror and it just didn't look that good, you know, whimsy and, and, and concealed passion and... and and skepticism, and, and then they saw the frost on the window, and they opened the window, and a cold blast like a knife came in, and they went out the front door, and this gorgeous whack of cold weather slapped them in the face, and suddenly narcissism is over for a while. <laughs> Welcome to the world. Here's the world. It's available to everybody on an equal basis. Everybody is just as cold as you are. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. There's a bus that pulled into, into Lake Wobegon on Friday night after it had turned so cold. It pulled in and it parked there in the dark in front of the Chat bless you, Chatterbox Cafe. <laughs> and it sat there, 20 teenage boys sitting there with their heads down, bowed, and this bald man, heavy set with a comb over, was talking to them seriously about something, and the man sitting behind the wheel who could not wait to get outside and have a cigarette. This was the Lake Wobegon Leonard's basketball team, and they had just come back from Brainerd where they got skinned, they got shocked, skinned, beaten, Badly, and the crowd made fun of them, and the other team smirked and jeered at them, and they and they and they lost by 35 points, and they went off to the dressing room after the game, and little girls taunted them as they as they ran down the hall, and they went into the locker room, and there was no hot water; it was only cold water. So there they were under a cold shower, and as they were drying off, they looked up, and here was a window, and people standing and staring at them. <laughs> pointing, laughing at them. They went out to the bus. Someone had let the air out of the tires of a rear wheel. The bus driver had to change it in the bitter cold. He was cursing. He was kicking the bus. He drove fast back to Lake Wobegon, almost put it in the ditch a couple of times. They pulled up and, and, and the coach, Coach Berner, gave them a talk about how if you put your minds to it, you can win. You can be a winner, which is patently untrue. <laughs> they sat and they listened to that and finally he let them go and they walked out and it was cold. It was a beautiful, cold night. Welcome to the world. This is our world. Reality. We prefer it to any form of illusion whatsoever. It's a beautiful thing. You walk out and you realize, what do I have to lose? Nothing. Nothing. I'm equal with all of these other people. Forget about privilege. Forget about 
power and authority. Everybody's in the same boat. No need to, to strive to be the youngest, richest person in the cemetery. Just live your life. Enjoy your life. That's the first thing. The Bunsens baptized a granddaughter last um, Sunday. It was Super Bowl Sunday. They did it after church because the children whose child this was, Clinton, Irene's granddaughter, are not believers, so they didn't want to do it in public. It was kind of a secret <laughs> baptism, you know, <laughs> like in the days of the Roman Empire. And... Uh, <laughs> Little girl's name was Lily. She screamed through the entire ceremony. Pastor Liz uh, did the did the baptism. It sort of it sort of subdued any powerful urge toward motherhood that a lot of <laughs> young women had. This this baby screeching, but they wound it up. They got it done in time for everybody to get home for the Super Bowl, except for the women who were meeting in their hooking circle, making rugs. They, they usually get together on Thursday afternoons, but they had a special Super Bowl football-free evening, hooking rugs, 12 women sitting in a circle and, and, and making rugs. They become good friends doing this, talking and telling stories as people can do in sort of low confidential voices while they're doing other things with their hands and not making eye contact. They just sit and work at the rug. They have this rug that they're working on which has the Last Supper in it. It was going to be a tapestry and then, and then it became round somehow. And <laughs> who knows how this happened, but there was no way to make it rectangular again, so it couldn't be a tapestry, so it's going to be a rug and it's going to be on Arlene Bunsen's dining room floor, right? And her dining room table will sit on it and if you spill something and you get down there, you'll see Jesus and the disciples and they're <laughs> waiting to absorb the spills from your table. <laughs> Meaning they're somewhere. They sat working on this, on this rug, which was supposed to be a tapestry, and Marilyn Tollerud started to tell the story of her of her grandfather, her grandfather, who on a cold winter day went to the doctor and got bad news that he had an inoperable brain tumor and he had a year to live. Which you would expect to be a terrible blow, but actually it was kind of liberating for him because you see, he'd been a terrible hypochondriac and he'd <laughs> worried every day about something being wrong and he expected to die next week or the week after this and now he had a whole year. A whole year stretched out in front of him and it just made him happy. It was like, it was like, it was like that cold day of, of winter. It, it, it was a stimulant, you see. And, and what do you have to lose now? You have a year in which to live. So your, your finances doesn't matter. What people think doesn't matter anymore. So why not just do as your heart leads you to do? What, what do you have to lose? You, you, you are naked in the world. So he quit the post office and he went to become a wilderness guide up in the north woods of Minnesota, up in the Boundary Waters, which he had always wanted to do. He'd always read National Geographic and he just loved those pictures. He didn't know much about the woods or canoeing or anything, but you know, the way to learn something is to teach it. Yes. <laughs> so he... He, he learned about trees and about birds and, and the weather and so forth so that he could teach people who were paying him to take them out in the North Woods. And the, finally, fall came along and, and his death was not far ahead. And he had seen this beautiful log cabin that was that was for sale. There was a little tiny for sale sign on the front door because the people who owned it did not want to sell it. It had... <laughs> 
been built by their grandfather who had come over from Sweden in, in 1917. And it was built in the Swedish style. They had squared off the logs, not just laid them on each other round, but they squared them off. Only Swedes do that for reasons they alone would know. And <laughs> he had come over to escape from the wars, the violence, the politics of Europe. He came to this country in 1917, and they wanted him to put on a uniform and go back to Europe and fight in the wars. And he did not want to do that. So he went up to the North Woods, and he built himself a cabin, and he lived out there in the woods, free from politics and mobs of people shouting slogans and, and, and angry men making speeches on the radio. He lived there. So the man with a year to live looked at this cabin and he thought of living there. But why would you buy a house when you had no time to live in it? Still, he was in love with this house. And so he bought it and he moved into it that winter, bitterly cold winter. He lived for 40 more years. <laughs> he outlived the doctor who had told him he had a year to live. He was 42 and he lived into his mid-80s and went to the doctor's memorial service <laughs> down in St. Paul. The doctor died at, at, at the age of 47. Friends of the doctors stood up and talked about how hard he worked. He worked terribly, terribly hard. The man who had outlived his prognosis went to the doctor's widow and said, I was a patient of your late husband's. I'm sorry that he died. Oh, she said, he really wasn't a very good doctor. <laughs> no, for me, he was. For me, he was the best. The world is available to you. It is out there waiting for you. Privilege, power means so little. Go out, enjoy your life, do what your heart tells you. That was the lesson of a cold winter day in Lake Wobegon. That's the news from Lake Wobegon where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average.